Uh, welcome to Airbnb's Design Talk series. This is our sixth installment, and I'm so thankful that you're all here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Katie Chen, and I'm an experienced designer here at Airbnb. Um, now, a bit about the series. Uh, we feature artists and creators uh, with different perspectives from all over the world. Uh, our hope is that through them, you'll introduce some friction and consideration to your creative process. Now, tonight we have Kieran Gandhi with us. Uh, Kieran is a musician uh, who has drum for MIA. She performs under the name Madame Gandhi. Uh, she's an activist with a mission to elevate and celebrate the female voice. Now, I first met Kieran a few months back at the Lesbians Who Tech conference here in San Francisco, and uh, I was just drawn to her energy and uh, her unapologetic delivery uh, of her message. And I'm so stoked she's here with us tonight. And uh, so without further ado, I introduce you to Kieran Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. Hi, good evening, good evening, good evening. How y'all doing? This is so exciting. I'm so happy to see you. Dang, you couldn't get chairs for all these people? Dang, okay, well, thank you for standing. It's healthy, I think. <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna move this mic so I have some space to first um, chat with you for a little while. I'd like to tell you my story, and then uh, Katie's gonna ask me some complicated questions, and I'm gonna do my best, and then I'm gonna perform for you. Does it work? <laughs> this is great, are you there? Yes, okay, cool. Um, by the way, I, I really wanted to rock some salmon today. I know that Airbnb <laughs> icon. <laughs> What's the name of the color? It has a color, I know it. Yes, Roush, of course. Yeah, I, I think uh, the pans are closer. <laughs> um, so my name is Kieran. I, I grew up in New York City playing the drums. Um, I loved it. I was a total Manhattan girl, um, born to two uh, Indian uh, immigrant parents who had come in to New York City from Bombay and New Delhi. Um, and I remember it, it was uh, probably 2000 or something like that, and I went out to Maine for a summer camp. And I think the idea was like, you're to New York City, like get involved with nature, that kind of vibe. And um, I went out there, and I remember I was so afraid of this lake. You know, they had a big lake. They forced all the kids to swim and do water activities and all this kind of thing. And so on day two, I snuck away, and I went to the theater cabin, okay? I went to the theater cabin, and I remember just trying to hide so that they wouldn't force me to swim. And I saw a drum set in the corner. So I sat down at it. I started trying to play it. And there was a maintenance man working in the theater cabin. And I thought for sure he would turn me in, you know, back to the lake for you type of vibe. And, um, and it turns out he was a drummer. So he's like, I got you. Let me show you how this is done. So he said, you know, my legs weren't even touching the floor. So he adjusted the stool and showed me how to do the whole thing and was teaching me some beats. And I loved it. I loved it. And I was hooked the whole summer. You know, they didn't care that I wasn't swimming as long as someone was watching me. So he had my back. You know, I felt really grateful. And I came back to New York City. I started telling my parents, yeah, I want to play the drums. They were with it. They were about it. My dad bought me a drum set, okay, in that, that, um, that year. And as I grew older, I was like, wow, you know, this is pretty woke. Two Indian parents supporting <laughs> a girl drummer. <laughs> this is pretty great. As I got older, I realized it was more for an extracurricular checkmark on my college applications. You feel me? That was more the vibe. That was more the vibe. Listen, Francisco, can you make the lights a little bit? You know, it's so bright. I can't see you. And I'm, I just want to connect a little bit better. Can you just dim it? Yeah, that's good. I just want to see you, that's all. It makes it difficult for me to speak into an ether. <laughs> there can be some. I just, you know, it's in my eyes. I just want to see who's here and see if, they're, if you're feeling it or not. Yeah, I like to make the story. I'll wrap it up quicker if you're not feeling it. If you're with me, then I keep going. You feel me? So I have to just catch the vibe. So, so I'm, in, I'm in New York City, I'm growing up, I'm getting ready for my college applications. Now, my parents really were all about giving back. You know, my younger brother and sister, they wanted all of us to be able to give back and, uh, and to sort of be leaders. <laughs> that was their whole thing. 
And uh, they wanted me to study political science. They were really into that. They wanted me to work maybe one day in the White House. Um, I grew up in, in Eleanor Roosevelt's townhouse in New York City. It was on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And so my mom and dad were very um, involved in sort of preserving political history, not only in our house, but, um, but sort of in, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I applied to Georgetown, and I got in, which was great. So I went to Georgetown. And I remember studying political science. And as soon as I got there, the truth is that it was kind of like, Bro vibes, you know? It was kind of bro vibes. Yeah, it was. I, I didn't know. I didn't really know. I, I went to an all-girls school in Manhattan, and I, w I wasn't even much on this feminism tip because I just I only saw women leading, you know? I only saw women leading. And so I remember <laughs> getting there, and on it was freshman year. It was freshman year, and a lot of the girls were waiting um, to get into some sort of party. And I said, where are we going? They're like, oh, we're going to the lacrosse house. I said, well, why are we going there? <laughs> you know? And I said, oh, that's the party for the night. So I remember I ended up going to, um, to the lacrosse house, and we were waiting in line. And there were some, <laughs> there were some guys there kind of telling us, like, you get to come in, you don't get to come in, you get to come in. I said, why are we waiting here? So I got inside. First of all, it smells terrible. First of all, the beer is awful. And the uh, quality of the music, I'm like, we have better music where we're at back in the dorm. So why are we doing this? And I was just so surprised at how, how pervasive sort of that leadership was at school and how very few women were kind of dominating the social scene. I remember even in class, a lot of fr my friends would kind of dim their light, you know, in the classroom. Give me, I just remembered something. Can you guys give me just two seconds? Give me one second, okay? Just give me one second. Yo, yo, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for just giving me a moment, you know. I just wanted to just get in my head for a second, so I really appreciate that. So I was in Georgetown, and I, I was choosing my majors. And I remember thinking, I have a humanities credit. And I saw that there's women's and gender studies as part of the uh, thing you can do for the humanities credit. And I was a little embarrassed, but I was so curious, I just quietly signed up for this class, and I went to it. And you know, within just hours of being in the class, I was so inspired, because so many of the issues that I was seeing on campus and that I had felt as a kid between gender dynamics were explained to me in such a constructive and professional way. Being able to understand power, being able to understand social hierarchy through people who had studied it, through theories, through books, was so empowering. And you see, sometimes when we're younger and we're dealing with emotions that make us feel upset about how the world works, about power structures on campus, you actually end up just being so emotional about it. It's non-productive, you know, it's non-productive. And so what I started to do during my time at Georgetown, first of all, I definitely kept taking the women's studies classes. Definitely kept taking those. And I remember starting to intellectualize my emotions. Intellectualizing the things that would make me mad. Intellectualizing the things that I was seeing with the frat houses and with how my friends who were girls kind of acting and, and not liking their situation, I would start intellectualizing so I can understand it. And it was very, very powerful. I also did a major in mathematics, mostly because I walked in with a ton of credits. And I, did, uh, and I did political science, because that was what my mom and dad wanted. So I did that. By the time I got to my junior year, I remember just feeling a little bit of like, dang, like this kind of college life, it feels boring, to be honest. I don't feel motivated by it. I feel good in the classroom, but I don't feel amped up on how my social situation is going. I don't feel stoked about a lot of the people who I'm meeting here. I really felt that way. And so I started hanging out in DC. Now, the DC music scene, out of nowhere, is popping, okay? It's popping. Do y'all know Thievery Corporation? So I found out that Thievery Corporation, first of all, not only owned the coolest lounge in the world, called 18th Street Lounge, they owned a bunch of different bars and music venues. And that even though they were two DJs, they would use a lot of the local musicians in DC to tour the world, to play French music, to play Jamaican music, African music, all over the, all over the world, Indian music. And I went to 18th Street Lounge. 18th Street Lounge is popping. Like, they used to have the um, record label in the back. It's three different floors. So, like, the first floor is a DJ, second floor is a live band, third floor is the patio. I mean, it was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. It was an old diplomat building. You know, DC has all these embassies. So, I remember Wednesday night was a reggae night. Okay, I was a college junior. Wednesday night was a reggae night. And I started going to reggae night. I loved it. I loved it. On the stage was like the, the, the metaphor for what I wish the world looked like. You know, it was an like amazing young uh, French singer and she would sing with two Jamaican brothers and then it would be a Cuban uh, conga player. You know, the whole thing was just extraordinary and the music was so uplifting. 
And you know, that band, they really helped me come of age as a musician. Every Wednesday I would go religiously. They would take me onto the stage and let me sit in on congas or drums or whatever. And it was this moment where I started moving from calling myself, like saying, I play the drums, to stepping into my shoes and say, I'm a drummer. You know, owning it as an identity. You know, so I'm gonna say, oh yeah, um, I code, you know, no, I'm a coder. You own my identity. And that helped me during those years. I remember thinking, dang, you know, I'm so joyful when I'm on the stage. I'm so joyful when I'm out meeting these musicians. I'm so joyful in these environments. And in Georgetown, I loved being in school. I loved learning all that stuff. But I didn't feel motivated by the social situation, you know? And I didn't like that separation. I didn't like this idea of, oh, maybe by day, um, I'll have a certain uh, job, and then at nighttime, I get to actually be joyful and happy and play my drums. I really wanted my whole life to be in music. I knew that. I knew that. I wanted to wake up. I wanted to work in music. I wanted my nighttime to be in music. I wanted the whole thing. By the time I was a senior, I remember feeling this anxiety because I had to tell my parents, no, I don't want to submit a White House internship application or a job. I just don't want to do it. Okay, and it was Obama. I mean, it would have been popping, I'm sure, but <laughs> now we take it for granted, right? <laughs> um, and instead, I saw that there was uh, an internship opportunity in LA to work at Interscope Records, and it was to work for a Georgetown alum. And so I hit him up. I was really overzealous trying to get a job by the time I graduated. And he's like, listen, we, this is a music industry. We got no jobs. We got no jobs but we can get you an internship. And so I said, hell yeah, let's do it, I want it. Now, my parents were embarrassed on my behalf, okay, when we had to come to Georgetown graduation. They put in the, the pamphlet what uh, each kid is doing after school, but they won't print it if you have an internship, okay? So my mom was like, just lie and say you own a record label or something, you know? I was like, no, mom, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. So I moved out to LA, I couldn't drive. I was a New Yorker, I couldn't drive. So I would just take the bus every day from Silver Lake, I have a hipster aesthetic, so everyone said that's where you should live. <laughs> you know, Silver Lake for you, Madam Gandhi. That was the. <laughs> <laughs> so I was living in Silver Lake. I would take the bus two hours to go work in Santa Monica at Interscope Records. And I got that internship because I was a math major, actually. You know, I, um, I saw, <laughs> I was working in digital, and I remember seeing. Um, that all these numbers were coming in from Spotify and from YouTube, it was 2011. And Spotify had just opened up in the States and they were sending numbers on all the artists who were signed to Interscope. So it was like Gaga and Kendrick Lamar and the Black Eyed Peas and Lana Del Rey, all these artists who I loved. And so I took some of these um, spreadsheets because I saw them in, in our digital marketing meetings and I went up to my boss, she was this badass woman running digital marketing. I was an intern at the time, I said, listen, you're getting all of these numbers from these places. They don't even know in the, in, internally at Interscope where to send these data sheets. Let me start analyzing them. We can put these numbers together. I'm a, I'm a millennial, you know, trust me. I know what to do with Spotify data, you know. <laughs> so, so, I kind of, so I started putting together these reports. They, they would send these data sheets with all the um, zip codes of where each of the artists were being streamed around the world or around the states. And so I started finding out patterns in Spotify streams, for example, you know, when in the industry, you gear up towards record release day, and everything is about that one day, because it's the Tower Records mentality. You know, you want all the records to be sold out on the day one, and then that sets sort of the barometer for the rest of the, of the album. Um, but with Spotify and with streaming, the music creeps up onto the platform, and it actually has a much longer life. So if you were to analyze streams on day of of a Kendrick or a L Lady Gaga record going on to Spotify on that day, you would be <laughs> very severely disappointed because that's not how the platform works. And so a lot of my work was understanding what are the expected rates over time for Spotify streams to come in. Or on YouTube, what is the expected engagement rate? If we put a YouTube video online, how many people should we expect to comment? Does it happen in the first week, in the second week, the third week? All these kinds of things. So after three months of interning, I got my first job working in the music industry. And it was so joyful. It was joyful because my, I felt like I was living my truth. You know, my day was in music, my evening was in music, I was drumming, it was popping, it was great. And LA is fun, I eventually learned how to drive. I have amazing yellow Prius, matches my drums. It was a great life. <laughs> so I was doing that. After two years, you know, I, I kind of felt like, so what's next? You know, there's no upward mobility for a digital analyst <laughs> at a record label. <laughs> 
And I remember thinking, you know, same idea. I have the business side that I'm so stoked on. I love working in the music industry. This stuff matters to me. And I also had the actual drumming, you know. I want my drumming to be on the next level. Now, I'll tell you something in the spirit of being vulnerable. You know, jealousy is a very powerful emotion, jealousy. Because you see, if you're jealous of something, it's like your body, a gut instinct telling you that this is something you may want in your own life. And I remember seeing all my friends going on tour all around the world as the trumpet player for um, some famous artist or as the guitarist for Lady Gaga or whatever it was. And I was like, dang, what a great life. That looks like a great life. And so I remember just having these two things. I was like, well, on one side, I want my, my business to go to the, next, to the next level. So I thought about grad school. I thought about getting my MBA. What would it look like if I go get a very traditional business degree and then come back into the music industry as, an, as a next level innovator? That excited me. But it also excited me to take my drumming to the next level, though. That excited me. So it's 2013. I was sitting at my desk, and my boss walks by, and I see in her calendar that she has MIA in her calendar. So I said, either she's about to dip for a minute, <laughs> or she's about to meet literally my favorite artist signed to Interscope. So I said, listen, can I come with you to the meeting? She said, and I'm not allowed to go to any of these meetings. I'm the fucking junior of the most junior, you know. <laughs> She's like, okay, you can come, but don't say anything. I said, okay, let's pop it. I'm coming. Let's go. So, so I, I went to the meeting. There's Maya. I'm literally jaw to the floor. I was so stoked. And you know, she had just put out the Bad Girls video, and she's wearing the yellow jacket, which is my favorite color. I was just, oh, so amazing, so amazing. But I was good. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. And Maya left. The meeting finished. It was about her album that was coming out and sort of the digital marketing strategy around that. Also, <laughs> I never get to share this. It was so funny. <laughs> Maya comes in and she has all these, like her website is a Tumblr, okay? And it works. It's so perfect for her. But the label is always like, we need to really get your website in order. She's like, it's in order. <laughs> what is she talking about? So I, I loved watching that. That was an amazing moment. Um, so when she left, I said to her product manager, I said, listen, I've seen the MIA show live. She can really use a drummer on that stage, okay? Maybe somebody who's female, okay? Maybe somebody who's Indian, brown, really fits the aesthetic. I think it could really work. And so <laughs> Diana looked at me. She's like, okay, listen, send me a video. Don't tell your boss, but send me a video. Uh, uh, maybe I'll pass it along to her. So I sent her a video. Diana sends it to Maya. Maya responds directly to me. She must have seen my Im email in that inbox. She responds directly to me. The, cap the, the title of the email was all capital letters. Hi. <laughs> yeah. And I knew it was her because it was some cryptic Gmail address. You know, it was dope. It was like what you think MIA is. She lives her truth. She is that. She is that. She's too dope. She's too dope. So. I open it up, also capital letters. So listen, hey, Kieran, thank you so much for this video. I love your drumming. This works really well. But we're not thinking about the tour just yet. And I'll hit you up when we do. Yo, if MIA sends you an email saying she likes your drumming, you're made. You're good. I printed that shit out, stuck it by my drums, and got on with my life, OK? <laughs> nice futurist female shirt. That's popping. <laughs> so. At the same time I was applying to business school, I got into Harvard, okay? I left Interscope of April 2013, and I was getting ready to move to Boston. That same summer, Maya hits me back. So, okay, we're ready for the tour, and we want to take you. Now, this is the best email you can ever receive in your whole life as a musician. It is the best email. And I felt so mad. I was like, that was manifestation. You can't teach that as manifestation. So I get this email, and I look at the dates. And it's exactly during my fall of HBO, of business school. And um, <laughs> I remember thinking, dang, should I go to Japan and to Poland and to the UK with MIA? Or should I study business? At, at, albeit the, <laughs> the breeding ground of the capitalist patriarchy, OK? <laughs> Harvard Business School. We have to learn how to fight fire with fire. You feel me? You have to know what's going on. What are they teaching them? And then we can take it and use it elsewhere. So I was, so I go there or I go here. Yeah. And one of my mentors, she sat me down. She said, I know exactly what you should do. I said, what's that? She said, you're going to do both. I, and that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what I did. So let me tell you. Let me tell you how it went down. So I go to class. First of all, 
I thought grad school was a joke. That's my bad. I thought it was more of a joke than an undergrad. <laughs> this shit is so serious. 9, 10, the door is closed. I didn't know all that. Okay, 9, 10, you can't come into the classroom in the morning. If you 9, 11, bye. No, I didn't know all that. So, first of all, it was way more strict than I thought it was going to be, way more oppressive. <laughs> but I remember thinking um, this can work. So, I would finish class on Friday, 2 p.m., and then fly to Poland to do this show back in town by Sunday. The next weekend, the UK. The next weekend after that, Chile. The next weekend after that, Argentina. Luckily, she was a parent. So she wasn't trying to go on those three-month tours. She was on this one-off weekend type of thing. So it worked for me. It was a dream. I'll never forget one particular weekend. It was November 13th week. She had put out the record, Matangi. And so we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday were all promotional shows in New York City. You know Terminal 5? Venue there. Yeah, still. <laughs> so... I was like, well, how am I going to do this? We have class all that time. So, okay, let's look at the times. Let's look at the flights. And I went for it. So Monday, fl class till 2 p.m. Then 3 p.m. I would go to Logan, fly to JFK, land. Then I would go to play the show. Then 4 a.m. the next morning, I would fly back to Boston. Tuesday, in my seat, 9 a.m., boom, safe, made it. <laughs> Read the case, answer the question. Then 2 p.m., Tuesday, fly back to, uh, to New York, play the show. Wednesday, come back to Boston, go to class. Wednesday night, fly back to New York, play the show, come back. And that was that week. That was that week. Luckily, you know in business school they do the cold call, which means that they call someone random in the class to start the whole day, you know, the, the class. And I got it on Thursday. But amazingly, it was on Kiehl's fucking lotion. <laughs> from, and it's from New York City, and it started by a gay guy. I was like, got this. <laughs> it was fine. Got, got you on that. So, so the stars align. The stars align. <laughs> Um, you know, my first semester was good because in day, it was sort of similar how I was describing to you about Georgetown. I was like, by day, I was learning a lot of amazing um, skills about business and finance and stuff that I didn't know and that I was excited to learn. And then at night, I was playing music, you know? It was awesome. Um, but you know, when musicians come back after a tour, and there's a lot of discussion about this in the music community, there's a lot of depression, you know, because you're like on such a high, you're traveling the world, and then you come back to normal life, it's like a denouement. And I definitely started experiencing that. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember, um, sorry, I'm laughing because I was thinking about all the like social, you know how they say in business, like FOMO, this whole thing of like fear of missing out? And everyone's like, well, don't you have FOMO that you travel the world with MIA? I'm like, no. <laughs> FOMO for business school, going on fucking cruise parties to drink in the afternoons or whatever. Like, I, I wasn't trying to do all that. So it was all good. And there was no FOMO. So I came back. And I remember um, at the start of the second semester, they send all the business school kids around the world. And they send them to em emerging markets. And so you have to work on it with a team of six people. And you go to some extraordinary part of the world, parts of Africa, parts of India, um, you name it, the Middle East. And you do some sort of consulting project, and it's for a week. And the reason they do it is so that Harvard kids learn how to not look like jackasses when they meet corporate executives from around the world, OK? That's why they do it. And I remember I, remember I was in a team. And there were, three, there were six of us, obviously, but three of the men, cis white, men, straight, sort of assumed the leadership role of the, of the group, which is cool. I, I'm OK with that. That's all good. Leadership is good. But not when you're using your leadership to elevate your own voice at the expense of everybody else. Does that make sense? And that, to me, leadership is actually about saying, OK, I'm going to use my assertiveness to, assertiveness to make sure that every person in the group is heard. Every person in the group is heard. I'm going to use my assertiveness to make sure that each person is contributing. Each person feels good. To me, that is leadership. OK, that is leadership. Leadership enables other leaders. Does that make sense? They, fucking, they teach you that at business school. That's why they're sending you on the damn trip. But the, the, practicing what you preach is a whole different story. OK? <laughs> so I remember that. Now, here's the thing that bothered me. We, were, we had such a cool project, too. You know, We were in Istanbul. Istanbul airport. And our job was to make sure that the airport was family friendly, okay? 
family friendly so that people who are traveling with kids felt comfortable throughout their time in the airport. It's one of the biggest international hubs. I love this. I'm like, dang, how am I going to get so lucky to have a fairly feministy project? This is popping. This is great. So I was so excited. But you know, these three men, they had so much arrogance towards our partners at TAV, the, the airport holding company that we were supposed to be working with. They had so much arrogance, this whole thing of like, <laughs> these people don't know what they're doing. Like, how are you going to be 25 not knowing anything and telling that these grown corporate executives who have been working at the Istanbul airport don't know anything? How could you have that kind of arrogance? <laughs> I don't know how candid I'm supposed to be on these kinds of <laughs> talks. <laughs> but honestly, like, yeah, I don't know how candid I'm supposed to be. But t it reminds me of like some old school colonialism entitlement type shit. It really does. It's got that same energy. It's like, you know, the British used to go to India, okay, in the fucking 1800s and tell Indians how to live. Oh, we got, we, let, let us show you how it's done, okay? Until leaders like Mahatma Gandhi, who you know I share a last name and stepped up and was like, no, actually, our homegrown cotton spun clothing is the only kind of material that will keep us cool under the hot Indian sun. We like our clothing. And no, our vegetarian ways are not because we're poor, but because it's healthy, sustainable, and delicious, okay? <laughs> And no, we're not interested. We're just not interested in raping our land and exploiting India's most vulnerable women to be able to feed your transcontinental tea leaf trading greed. We're just not that interested, you know? And so it had that same energy to it. I remember thinking about that in the group. And I remember I, I wanted to say that. I wanted to say that. Like, how, how can the three of you have so much arrogance that you think you know better than, than the people who are working with. This is such a cool project. We should come in with some humility and the desire to make some adjustments here and contribute something valuable. This is great. But the energy of like, those fucking idiots, they don't know what they're talking about. It sets the wrong vibe for the nature of the relationship. Do you know what I mean? So I remember feeling that, but I couldn't say it. I couldn't say it. You have ever been in a situation where you feel kind of bullied and then two days later you're like, oh, I should have said this, 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 this. You know what I mean? It's like, oh. And you know, as women, and maybe I should just speak for myself, and for me, my anger doesn't look like anger and like in a male way. It looks like tearing up. It looks feeling, feeling like I can't say what I want to say. So tearing up and crying, that's not weakness. That's female anger. That's the fuck you. That's what that is. That's what that is. So I remember feeling that way. I remember feeling that way. And I remember feeling as I went into my second year of business school, a bit of imposter syndrome, because that stuff can make you question, like, dang, I'm so assertive, you know? And <laughs> by the way, I read the comments from the group project, because we had to give each other feedback. Like, oh, Kieran, Kieran didn't speak much. Oh, I've been speaking, y'all weren't listening, though. I've been speaking, and I'll be speaking. So I felt a bit of imposter syndrome. That experience kind of messed with me, made me feel insecure. It did. Imposter syndrome is kind of this notion that you feel like you're the um, diversity check mark, you know? Oh, a brown, queer, Indian, <laughs> she can come. Musician, it's a diverse industry, you know, she can come. So you feel like this imposter syndrome. Even though my grades were great, the GMAT was so strong, all that stuff, I, I deserve to be there, and yet you feel like you're the diversity quotient. And at the same time, let me tell you, in, in Boston, have, have y'all, who's been to Boston? Y'all know about Boston. So there's this river in Cambridge, the Charles River, goes throughout the whole city, Boston, Cambridge. And I started noticing the runners, okay? The runners will be running, it's fucking snowing, hailing, raining, they're running! They don't care, it's so powerful, so powerful. I was like, dang, I wanna be raw like y'all, to be real. And the funny thing is I had sent my Prius from LA. Okay, every day I would get stuck in the damn snow trying to go to business school. Okay, every day. It was like four blocks. I wouldn't walk it. That was that bad. It was bad. Same theme from when my parents tried to send me to Maine to learn how to be a little bit more nature oriented, a little more rough. So I saw these runners. I'm like, dang, you know what? If you run five miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, you earned that. No one can take that away from you. Whether you're gay, straight, black, white, tall, short, if you ran fucking five miles, that's yours. No one's questioning. The, uh, the achievement of that. Does that make sense? I loved that. I was like, mm. So I started running my ass off. <laughs> yeah, I started running my ass off. So I started running. 
And I didn't tell anybody because you see, people are so competitive because of their own insecurity. You know, the second you tell someone, oh, I ran X and oh, how much? How far did you run? What, uh, what, uh, app, what app are you using, you know? <laughs> how fast did you run? Are you, are you training for a race or something? <sighs> so I didn't tell anybody because people are like that. The second, it's like when you tell someone that you're vegan, they're like, oh, well, you know, I've heard that if you don't eat eggs, it's really bad for you, actually. <laughs> I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> you know, when you look at nature, flowers, okay, Flowers don't look left and right and say, what color are your petals? Oh, mine need to be more purple. And oh my God, you're so tall, I need to be taller. No, you can bloom and I can bloom and you can bloom. We can all be blooming in our own way. You know what I mean? Right. So I started to run, started to run. And by the time of my, uh, I wasn't that good at it. I would just start from here and say, can I make it to this one bridge? If not, I'll Uber home, you know? <laughs> yeah, you have to just give yourself a safety net. <laughs> Amazing Spotify playlist, the whole thing, it was great. Slowly, five miles, 10 miles, I was getting it, I was getting it, I loved it, I loved it. And by the time I was about to graduate in my second year, 2015, one of my friends convinced me to run the London Marathon with her. And I said, all right, let's do it. What's the worst that can happen? I still could Uber home. <laughs> Not gonna tell anybody about this. <laughs> so uh, it was April of 2015. And I got to the start line of the London Marathon. <laughs> and I remember thinking, dang, I feel nervous. You know, my stomach, I feel nervous, a lot of anxiety. And then I put two and two together, and I realized I'm about to start my period, OK? <laughs> right. And for those of you in the audience who have never had a period, let me tell you what you're not trying to do on day one of your period. <laughs> it's to run 26.2 miles. So like any of us who have been caught unprepared on our cycle, I started evaluating my options, okay? <laughs> Toilet paper situation, nah. Quick fix, not gonna work for 26 miles. A pad, no. Chafing is a real thing on a marathon course. No man I know would take cotton, stuff it between his balls and go run 26 miles. <laughs> I didn't have a diva cup on me. Um, and a tampon, I guess so, but I didn't have one in that moment. I didn't want to run with an extra one to change it out halfway through. There's no privacy on a marathon course. I imagine me changing myself out in front of the kids would be more scarring than anything else. <laughs> I didn't want a half in, half out situation. I didn't know what the string was going to do. And all of this shit. <laughs> First world millennial woman, all the privilege in the world. No one talks about this shit. So there I am at the start of the night. I didn't know what to do. All I knew is Juju is like, you want to run in the outfit that you prepared in. And I had a dope, actually, I was wearing the same colors. <laughs> so I wasn't repping Airbnb in that moment. I was repping breast cancer care, but same color. And um, I was like, I just want to run in these shoes that I know will work, in these exact socks, these exact pants, this bra. I don't want to wear anything different that I haven't practiced. So I decided to take some might off for the pain, bleed freely, and just run. I need to feel you. So that's good that you just did something there. That's good. Um, so as I was running, as I was running, you know, I knew it was a privileged choice in that moment to reject my own shame, to actually prioritize my own comfort as opposed to the comfort of people watching. And I also thought, I also was like, excuse me, I'm the one running, I'm the one running the marathon, okay? You're eating fucking popcorn. How are you gonna try to sh shame me? You come run 26 miles on day one of your cycle, then we can talk about shaming. You feel me? So I knew there was enormous power in the fact that I was the marathoner and I was making that choice. I knew there was power in that. But while I also knew that it was a privileged choice to choose to bleed in that moment. Millions of women and girls around the world do not have that same choice. And that moreover, they lack the access to the products they need to be able to take care of themselves on their period. Why? Because the taboo is so deep, no one wants to talk about the most natural and normal part of the female <laughs> reproductive system, the reason that we're all here, the fact that women do extraordinary things every single day, despite the pain and all of that kind of stuff, we just quiet it and put it away. So much power in that. 
and more on, on more of a positive note, I rarely say this because sometimes it's like too hippie vibe for like a tech audience, but this is how I feel, which is that isn't it so amazing that we have the moon each month and the female body is connected to the moon? <laughs> like, why are we not talking about that? This shit is so powerful. It's amazing. How amazing. And how amazing that each month as women we get to release whatever bad vibes from the month that we're there by. Gone. And then we get to track ourselves. Well, this time last month, what was happening? Can I benchmark my progress? Can I benchmark my joy? Understanding how we feel really amazing at some times and not so amazing and how there's a cycle associated with that is so profound. It's awesome. But that's not the way we talk about this stuff in this day and age. We don't. It's with shame, it's with ugliness, it's with oppression. I hate that stuff. In the developing world, I knew about this. I grew up between Bombay and India, so I was very dialed in to this issue. But I hadn't thought about it until I was put in the situation and immediately started developing this empathy around the situation as I ran. And when I crossed the finish line, I decided to write a blog post about this experience. Not only because it felt really good to run so powerfully, it's like bleeding 26 Bleeding from anywhere for 26 miles is like a punk rock move, <laughs> if you ask me. That's some punk rock type shit. That's some MIA playing the Grammys when she's pregnant type shit, you know? And so I wrote a blog post about it. I wrote about how um, in the developing world, very few developing dollars actually go to women's needs. That's because we define what is sort of standard according to male needs, which I understand. It's like, okay, shelter, clothing, food. But we don't acknowledge the fact that women have different needs and they also have to be dealt with. That in most countries, um, women's needs are so uh, sort of at the bottom of the list. It's the reason why we say women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. We just say that over and over again. Um, I wrote about the organizations that I do think are doing really extraordinary work to enable women to have access to the products they need. I wrote about how most young girls, especially in India, start dropping out of school in seventh grade by the time they hit menstruation and puberty because they don't have access to the products they need. They don't want to be bleeding in school. They don't want to feel uncomfortable. Any one of us can understand that. So they start self-selecting out. They fall behind. So I wrote about all these things. I posted it on my Facebook. 82 likes, amazing post. <laughs> I graduated from business school. I was trying to get a job at Spotify. And in June of that summer, 2015, a friend of mine who works for Mike.com asked if she can repost my piece because she said it really worked for their identities segment. I said, yes, of course. And within 24 hours, the story went completely viral. Okay, completely viral. I'm at fucking Spotify, sorry, I shouldn't care. It's a, it's a emphatic cursing. I was at Spotify, okay, and the BBC is like, hello, can we speak to you about your period? You know, so I'm in like the kitchenette. <laughs> I'm in the kitchenette, you know, trying to be like, like this type of vibe, trying to answer these all. And then the New York Times is calling me, and then the LA Weekly, and people from Nigeria, and people from India, and all over the world, my phone and my email uh, were blowing up. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I wasn't expecting that. I had no idea. Am I supposed to be uh, giving all the answers? What am I supposed to do? And moreover, I kind of felt like, um, you know, there was so much negative energy as well. A lot of people being like, this is so disgusting and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, first of all, you're proving my point. The whole point is for us to destigmatize this. Second of all, I don't care what you say. I just tricked you, the whole world, into talking about periods for a week straight. <laughs> Donald Trump had said some insulting stuff about Megyn Kelly's period right at that time, so it was a perfect storm. Women were live treating their periods to Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, people were like, you know, I'm not... I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't free bleed like that crazy marathoner, but I definitely understand that what Donald Trump did was wrong. I was like, great, progress, this is great. <laughs> you know, sometimes you take one for the team, you, it, by, by me having this sort of um, clickbait, and it was a clickbait type story, um, they're talking about these issues in a way that doesn't protect them a little bit because they don't have to talk about their own body. You know, we, we, we don't have to talk about our own body, we can just talk about the marathoner and how they feel about the situation like that. So this happened, and it really changed my life. I remember calling up one of my professors and saying, what should I do? Should I just try to avoid all this and die it down? Or should I, what should I do? And she was like, you know, you, you don't have a full-time job. You've been talking about these issues forever. Pick up the phone and talk to every single person that you can and say all the things that you've been wanting to say because you have this megaphone for a very short amount of time. 
And so that's exactly what I did. So everyone, I would just tell all the different things. I would point to all the organizations who were doing extraordinary work in this space. And, uh, and it was amazing. So I didn't last too long at Spotify. <laughs> And I started traveling the world, this time not to play the drums, but to speak about these issues that I had cared about for so long and to get better at doing it. At the same time, I remember, you know, this is so important to me, and that's why I say my mission is to elevate and celebrate the female voice. We think about the tools that we have to be able to make the very difference that we want to make in the world. And for me, it was my speaking, but also it was my music. It was my music. But I'm a drummer, you know, I was always drumming on somebody else's project, helping MIA uplift her voice, helping Thievery uplift their voice, or whomever I was working with. And so I decided to really step into my shoes as a musician and say, well, listen, I can sing fucking four notes, so I'm going to just sing them loud and proud. <laughs> I'm going to start owning my voice. So I wrote my record the same time that I was traveling to speak about menstrual health and hygiene and about gender equality. The record came out in October. It's called Voices. We have a bunch of them over there, which I'll meet you after the talk today um, if you want to buy them. And, um, and, and it's so far so good. You know, um, the, my song, The Future is Female, it was um, on the Spotify charts after the Women's March in January. Um, I think, you know, my, my desire to marry my music with my feminism has allowed me to interact with extraordinary people like yourself, which gives me a lot of joy. And I feel like on a day-to-day -day moment, I'm either just spending every hour doing music or feminism. So it's a joyful life, you know, it's a joyful life. Um, and I feel kind of like, like, yeah, this is living, living your truth. You know, I feel good about that. So that's kind of where the story ends. Then I was in San Francisco at Airbnb, <laughs> hanging out with some of the top people in the tech industry for an evening. And I'm very joyful to be here. And thank you for this opportunity. Whatever um, you want to ask, just mm -hmm. remember it. Katie's going to ask some stuff, and then we'll open it, right? Yeah. All right, everybody, how was that? <laughs> That's an extraordinary life so far, and it's very impressive. Um, where I have some questions prepared, but we'll have time for, um, for uh, the mic to be passed around. So um, if you have a question, uh, you know, kind of take your time, digest what you've just heard about. Uh, Kieran and, and her story. And uh, the, the moment we'll, uh, I'll start off with some questions and then we'll open up to the floor. How's that sound? Excellent. Great. Do you like my glasses? I just got them. They were a gift. They gave me yellow glasses. I really like them. I, I saw them on the weekend when I saw you at your show and oh, I was yeah. like, I want them. Yeah. Oh, good. I was like, these ones have on? prescription. Otherwise, I would have given them to you. But now I, I mean, can see everybody. Even now better. that now that I think I want glasses, does anybody want these? Like, do you want to <laughs> tell us where you got them? Oh, they're from this badass woman in uh, L.A. called L.A. Eye Works. She sent them to me because she knows I like yellow. It was nice. That was a nice moment. When you're on a, when you're on an artist budget, they'll just send you some free clothing and then you just put it on your Instagram. It's an attention economy, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> All right. Um, now, I, I'm going to go get a little personal here, so everybody bear with me a little bit. Now, I've just recently met up with a friend, and um, he's a dude, a uh, cis white dude. And one of the things is, I, I can tell, you're a feminist. And we were like, my friend asked him, hey, are, you know, are you, would you consider yourself a feminist? And he said, he said, no, you know, it's extremism. Hmm. And... I just want to make sure we're all on the same page hmm. to get your perspective on that. So, you know, what is your definition of feminism? Like, what could what could I have had said to him that yeah. made me feel? He's like, I respect women's rights. I, w I respect women's rights. I believe they should paid e be paid equally. But I wouldn't consider myself a feminist, and I would not be associated with feminism. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think the reason why feminism comes off as aggressive is that the earliest waves of it absolutely had to be. Shit was fucked up. <laughs> and I respect that the earliest leaders in feminism 
led with their anger because that was the fuel that allowed them to go through so much of the difficult times they did, whether it was about getting women's rights to vote, whether it was about the 60s being a second feminism, a second wave feminism, about reproductive rights, about abortion care, all this kind of thing. It had to have a fierceness because the backlash was so strong. And also, it's tied to homophobia because a lot of the women who were in that movement in the earliest days were gay and were very openly open about that. And we had deep homophobia, and so we rejected feminism. Moreover, some of the earliest waves of feminism, it's no uh, secret, were not inclusive. You know, it was a very white, privileged um, movement. And it wasn't inclusive. It wasn't about bringing up other people of color. It was not about um, being queer inclusive, trans inclusive, none of that. It was always this thing of like, us first, then you, you know, this type of vibe. And listen, when people are leading a scrappy movement, they're just doing what they think is the best in that moment. So we're never going to we're never gonna, I don't think that it's not productive to be upset about those things. It's just saying, yes and. I'm glad you made a little chip and now we're gonna do it even better. We're gonna learn from your mistakes and we're gonna do it better. So for me, I really think about fourth wave as something that's not much related to men and instead is about valuing what women bring to the table and about valuing female energy on a spectrum. Right now, we live in a world that Gloria Steinem describes is ranked and not linked. What if instead we lived in a world that is linked and not ranked? And I'm so obsessed with this because to me it ends up being about what do you as a person bring to the table? What do you do, what do you bring to the table? What does the female energy bring to the table? What can we learn from the women? We've been learning from the men, we know about you. We know about leadership, we know about being strong, tough, all this kind of thing. But if you look at even the political system now, we're on this brute force, not listening, male ego, my dick is bigger than yours, bullshit. And it's not working. What can we learn from the women in our life, from the elders in our life? What can we learn from, from <laughs> I mean, Harriet Tubman, dang. Harriet Tubman used to walk so hundreds of th hundreds and thousands of people across uh, into, into freedom, you know, that kind of maternal bravery. A lot of people um, don't like to essentialize female versus male energy. And I understand that. For me, it's about recognizing that the spectrum shouldn't look like this. And that female shouldn't be an insult. You know, this idea, don't be such a pussy, don't be so girly. I want that to be a positive thing. Like, damn, a pussy, this is strong. This is so strong. <laughs> it can do so much. <laughs> How amazing. And honestly, I was talking, you know, Alicia Keys' manager, her name is Erica, she said such a funny thing the other day. She said, I don't know why we, we say, like, we glorify the phallus so much. If you kick someone in the balls, he's doubled over in pain, okay? I said, that's actually quite true. I didn't think of that, you know? So for me, it's about valuing what women bring to the table. It's about creating a spectrum of bookends so that it's not ring linked, it's not ranked. And instead, it's like, I want to be female as much as I want to be male. I want to learn from the women in my life as much as I want to learn from the men in my life. And that we each have some sort of mix of both energies. And that we each exist on some part of that. To me, when you combat misogyny, which is the, the desire to not be female, to not like what women bring to the table, you start to combat all the issues related to trans culture, to homophobia. They're all part of the same thing. When we insult people who are gay, it's because they're not following an oppressive gender binary. So for me, feminism is about valuing what women bring to the table. It's about wanting to be collaborative, emotionally intelligent, and it's about wanting to live in a world that is linked and not ranked. Yeah. All right. Th this kind of dives into hits close to home for, for tech. I think right now we have this issue where it does feel like everybody has this quota that they need to fill. And this made me think back on our conversation kind of earlier about, you know, we're, we're in a room full of creatives and, and designers, people that influence and design the world that we're going to be living in. And, um, you know, and now we've got this industry where it's really cri criticized for being not needing a quota for, for diversity. And it, it lean back to our conversation about, you know, your story about the first time you sat behind a drum kit. And uh, would you mind sharing the audience that story? Because I think it's very valuable to see what it means to have a different perspective yeah. in a room where you're designing the future. Yes. Yeah, that's why this is so cool to be here. You know, I think that it's not about diversity for diversity's sake. It's that 
feminism and capitalism, that's like a whole other talk. Like we, that I'm like constantly working through my sort of where I fall on those and how they can work together. But I do think that there is very much a business case to be able to have people of different walks of life working at your company so that then when they're selling a product and making the next um, batch of products, they're keeping in mind the very diverse uh, 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 audience that they're selling to. You know, this whole Pepsi fiasco, where were the people of color in the fucking room being like, you're gonna put white people fighting against a policeman and dancing around with a Pepsi can? No, nah, that's gonna cost you a fuck ton of money if you put that out. Yeah, no, where was that? Because whatever culture was happening internally, that person probably didn't feel safe enough to actually raise their hand and say that, or they just weren't there. They just weren't there. So there is 100% a business case to be inclusive and to design for a whole varying type of people. Now, I always think about drums, okay? Let's just take a moment to look at Madame Drumset, okay? Can y'all see her? Yeah, she's popping, she's popping. Now, it took me a long time to be sponsored as a drummer. You know, it, it took me a long time. But when I finally had the chance to be sponsored and tell my drum company, DW, what I wanted, it was so empowering to say, don't send me those fucking huge ass drums. I don't want that. My whole life I've been playing stuff that doesn't fit me, doesn't fit my 5'4 anatomy. And so it was so empowering for me to say, I want a floor tom that's only 15 inches in diameter, and I want a snare that's 13 inches, A, so I can carry it, and B, so that it fits me, so I feel powerful when I sit at my own kit. It's a throne, you feel me? It's a throne. So much of when I was growing up, you go there, the girls immediately, they walk into Guitar Center, they're like, yeah, trumpet. I'm not gonna fuck with them. <laughs> it's too big for the female anatomy, so now you've just cut your entire potential market opportunity in half because you're not building products for people who could have potentially loved to play the drums. And so it was so empowering for me to be able to tell my drum company, hey, make this for me, and not only that, consider who you're building for. Consider who you're building for. Wow, talk about user personas. <laughs> you ever think about like who's gonna be in the room to be able to voice these things? Like As a designer, I think about what you just said, and it's profound, you know? It's, it, and the way you talk about making space, to have somebody to have their own voice, the leaders in the room, the people in the room have to actually make that space for people to own their voice, right? And to own your voice enough to actually voice concerns about how you're gonna design right. anything. That's so cool. Now, I'm aware of time and I know we have questions. So do we have any questions from the audience? Would anybody ask anything? Yes, we have one person over here. Oh. Yeah, we'll start there, and there's another person over here. Hey, hello. I'm Randy. Um, I was making noise about DC because I'm from there. Yes. Oh <laughs> um, so my question is, um, how do you go about amplifying the invisible? Mm. Um, because when I think about your experience with your period, it became visible on that day because you didn't have any products mm. to make it invisible. Mm. Um, and I think about people who've had abortions, who you cannot see by looking at someone who've had, who's had an abortion that they've experienced that trauma. Um, and I think about the invisible grieving that a lot of people in the black community go through. Um, there was a 15-year-old boy, Jordan Edwards, um, who was shot and killed over the weekend in Texas. And I felt myself feeling very invisible yesterday because there were so many people who don't even know his name. Um, so if you hadn't had that email from Maya, if you hadn't had that phone call about the article, how would you have gone about making and amplifying uh, the invisible to make it visible? I love this question and thank you for that. Um, I, I think there's so many ways to answer it, but the one that comes to mind that I, that I think is kind of like a very literal tool as opposed to like a higher level theory type thing is how we do live in a world with social media. And I think it's actually very amazing that we can have, well, the criticism of activism today, of hashtag activism, is that once you've retweeted the thing, you've done nothing else after that. You know, you may not be living your truth in your day-to-day -day life. You think that you've sort of checked up your, your goodwill for the day. But Patrice Cullors, who's one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, she talks about how this one-to-one -one ratio of whatever happens online then comes happens in the streets or happens in your day-to-day -day life. You're living the very truth that you're, you're pro projecting. Another woman I spoke to here, Verity Breen, she's a very well-known runner, she's Australian. You know, she said to me um, about our generation, she said, I hope your generation is exactly the truth that they claim to be on their social media. 
And I always think about this. You know, I always think about this. So my answer to you is I think that it does start by using the fact that everyone is on their phones all the time to raise awareness about these issues. I wonder, you found out about this probably because of online, right? Yes? Yeah, which is amazing. And I think being able to share that to your audience, being able to remember that no matter who is following you and watching you, each of us have a sphere of influence. Even with this election, I actually think the work of a family member talking to their parents or talking to the sibling or talking to whomever who um, had different opposing views during the election, there is so much bravery in you just handling your own family than to try to be like a big leader. Do you know what I mean? If each of us just handled our, our own family or our own sort of backyard, our own sphere of influence, we would make enormous uh, change. So my answer is I think it's about using tools online and then using your own day-to-day three-dimensional experience to elevate those voices unheard by talking about these issues. Great. <laughs> and do we have another question in the audience? So we've got one here. Hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, Hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, <laughs> from DC, so I'm also on the The mic closer to you. Yeah, you got it. Cool. Also from DC. So. Woo! Um, I work at the Circular Board. At the what? I work at the Circular Board. Okay. I'm the only man there. We are a female-focused entrepreneurship company. So we invest only in female founders. We invest in yep. only female founders. And we are the fastest-growing accelerator. Huge. <laughs> I'm not moving my hand at all. I don't swear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question is about getting more people <laughs> with a larger. Okay, awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna restart. I work at the Circular Board. Yes. I lead product design. The only male there. We Ooh. focus on investing in teaching and training female founders around the world. We are trying to get more exposure because there are only maybe six VCs who have funds bigger than six figures. Mm. There was not a single female founded funder um, in the state last year mm. besides Texas. Mm. And we're trying to change that for this year. We have zero celebrity influence besides mm. some philanthropic women, but of color, we only have one investor. We're trying to get more like musicians, people who have bigger pictures of influence, people who are more young involved in spreading the message of, if you wanna make a big impact, if you can change the people who are running the businesses, mm. you might change the audiences that influence and use their products. So what's the question? <laughs> How do you get people like it? you more involved in? Oh, me? Yeah. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> of course. That's a yes. I would, did, did you say, did, he, did you ask me if I will be involved? How do we get more people like you involved? Yeah, of course. I, would, I think that's amazing. I think the whole culture right now, when I mentioned as a joke about my glasses, this idea of the attention economy, I think that's real. I think we are in a world right now where money follows attention. People who are developing their platforms based on whatever they do, maybe they're posting drumming videos on Instagram all day or juggling or whatever. People, you, th this weird micro-celebrity culture, influencers, that's what they're called, influencers <laughs> culture is so huge. I went to this running event with Adidas two months ago here in San Francisco, and I would meet all these young women from around the world. I would like go on their social, one million followers, fucking 200K followers. Like, everyone, everyone's an anonymous celebrity. But the beauty of that is that then so many tribes can be emerging in order to be responsible for their sphere of influence, per my point earlier with your question. And so I, I think that you're absolutely right. I think by telling each of the, and I, I would be happy to find more musicians to be talking about this and to draw attention to it. Um, musicians tend not to have money, so I don't know what, <laughs> what you're thinking. <laughs> um, but I do, uh, I do like this idea of using uh, your platform for good. So I got you. Yes. I, it's really interesting how you just mentioned those stats, just how bleak it looks. You know, it's surprising. We, 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 I'm looking around this room um, and to hear that there are so few women in the position where we need them. Um, are there other questions in the room? Um, I can't really. Yes, so we have one in the. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Kevin Leaf. Um, I think about that moment when it was amazing to hear your story, also. Uh, I think about. I know Kevin. Do I know the story? Um, Let's check. I mean, I didn't know it this way. And so like <laughs> moments like when 
you were getting all the calls and then you were given the advice to, you have the megaphone now, now speak what, what you've wanted to say. You were there. He was there with me in Boston. We have like amazing shisha joint. It's like a Middle Eastern hookah spot. I mean, it's like so legit. There's no one who speaks English there. So we always post up there. And he was there when I was getting all those calls. You remember that? Yeah. And <laughs> like, I remember it. I remember it from the ang from like, I, I go back to it now because I think about where I'm at now and where many, many of us are at a place where we might be at a table where you were when you were at HBS in Istanbul and you wanted to speak, mm. but you felt like the imposter syndrome 100%. or you felt like you were, you know, double thinking what you wanted hmm. to say. And so what I, what I wonder now is like, you know, before, I if you weren't given the, the, the megaphone, like what would you mm. have told yourself back then? Mm. You know, like what, what would you, cause I can imagine we're in the same position. We're all designing products and mm. we're trying to get our opinions out there, but we're in a room of people. Mm. How would you go about mustering up the courage? Yeah, there's a couple different things that I've been thinking a lot about. The first one is intellectualizing anything. You know, for me, um, every time that I've spoken from anger or from emotion, unfortunately, it never translates. It never translates. Even if what I'm saying has value to it, you know? And I've learned how to intellectualize my emotions so when I explain something, it's very logic oriented. Like I'll give you one example. When I talk about feminism sometimes, I think about um, this example. You know how Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg used to talk about how, oh, I wear pretty much the same outfit every day to eliminate decisions in my mind, to free up space for other more important decisions, okay? Like you're wearing a fucking t-shirt and sneakers to work, okay? But the women are expected to have their nails good, their hair good, their eyes good, the outfit good, all that stuff takes so much more time. And so if each of us are given only 24 hours in a day, but you tell one group you can wear whatever you want, but you tell another group, not literally, but through plenty of social cues, and that's, sexism doesn't look literal, it looks subtle, which is why it's so difficult to combat. It's an energetic thing. But if you tell one group you're supposed to look this way, it's taking away from our ability as women to be practicing our drums, to be preparing for a board meeting, to be advancing ourselves in different parts of the country, uh, company. So that's one thing, using logic to be able to explain something. And that takes practicing until people have, you've earned their trust. And it's annoying. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't matter who says the thing. You know, Trump, he was at a place where he could have stand on a stage and he's like, listen, one plus one equals four. I know these liberal idiots have been telling you that one plus one equals two, but really one plus one equals four, it's been equaling four, and that's how it's gonna be, you know? It, but it, it matters who says it, because if someone who looks different than a strong, assertive, white, tall male says it, then we're not gonna listen as much, and that's such a problem. So the first is logic. The second thing, interesting, I learned this at business school that I like, is this idea of bringing together, is, is about uh, making individual friends. So instead of trying to deal with the entire group, you work one-on-one -on -one with someone first. You know, hey, how did you think that meeting went? You know, I didn't say this, but I kind of thought this. What do you think? You know, you work together to gain their trust. Now they know, hey, this person has some good ideas. Maybe even you can develop a situation where in the next meeting you say, hey, can you punt to me so that I can share this and it doesn't come off as off-putting or whatever, you know? So I think that's the second one, developing your friends. And then I think the third is for us to teach the next generation of leaders to say leadership is not about asserting your power over somebody else. Leadership is about enabling other leaders. It's the same flower mentality I just talked about. You get to bloom and you get to bloom and you get to bloom. We can all different bloom in our own way. And moreover, that if each of us say plenty of things collectively, we can get to the best idea. The best idea comes out as a group. And also, one more thing I'll add, sorry to keep going on and on, but this, uh, this gets me really going. The last thing is that, <laughs> the last thing, and I like this, this is a Socratic method, this is one great thing about business school that I like, is that if, let's say, person A says something, it may not be the final product design, it might be the final idea, but in them even saying it, it's now sparked the brain of person B to then say something. And like, oh, I wouldn't have thought about that had this person not framed it that way. Then maybe person C is like, dang, okay, we're going on this train. Cool, uh, what about this? And collectively by everyone feeling safe enough to say something, even if it's wrong, in you saying it, the value is that you've motivated the whole group to collectively get to the best situation, that all perspectives and ideas have been considered, that maybe Pepsi shouldn't put out a racist commercial. 
you know? So those are my thoughts. That is so relevant to, I, can, I speak for myself, it's incredibly relevant to me, especially, uh, you know, not, not Airbnb's great, Airbnb's great, don't get me wrong. Um, but you, I do hear a lot of these questions, uh, especially um, in rooms where it could be really intimidating. You know, people have titles, they're intimidating. This is wonderful. I'm going to try and practice them. Um, I'm afraid, like, this is all the time we have for, like, all the questions. One more? You want one more question? Yeah, I mean, yeah. this All is right. more important than me playing the drums, I think. <laughs> All I right. really mean that. <laughs> All right. Can I? Yeah. yeah. I feel like with this fourth wave of feminism coming through, I've like identified the misogyny that was deep inside of me, just from like you me said, too. that subtle energy. Me too, 100%. But it's made me more angry, and I'm like, how? and you've expressed emotion that way, how do you deal with that? I always have to process my emotion first by myself. I mean, I'm Pisces. We got all the emotions in the world. You know, I'm a Pisces, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we got all the emotions in the world. So I make sure not to act in that moment reactionary on my emotion. And I read so much, I read so much. And I, I said it before, but really that's my main tool to say, how do I intellectualize all these things that really make me upset, but recognize that me being upset about it doesn't fix the problem. And if the end goal is to fix the problem, I have to be able to speak with logic about why these things matter. And moreover, to make the case that's compelling to a large enough group of people that feminism is not a diversity check mark, that being able to have a corporate culture that's inclusive of your women is only, <laughs> is only good for business and that it's only gonna make the quality of the work that you're putting out next level because people who are women are buying your product. I think with internalized misogyny, dang, like that is so real, that is so real. I think the first step is self-awareness and then the second step is intellectualizing your emotions. Mm. All right, Kieran, you wanna play us some music maybe? Oh. Yeah? All right. This conversation is so good. I'd have to sit around and read one more question. You want one more? I think we should, this is so much more important. Okay. I mean, what, what, is, what does the crowd want? Can I? Can yes, I? let them decide. Yeah. But I think we should maybe do one, at least one yeah. more. This is so important. This right. is the top people in the world. We have a chance here to make a difference, All Katie. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm not spotting anybody. I kind of feel like the last question needs like a fight for the death or? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You got Hello. it. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Jen. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a question. How have you or how would you speak to a group of people that don't already agree with what you're saying? Because I know that I'm here. I can't speak for everyone, but I'm, I'm here because I kind of knew all of the things and feel all of the things that you've been talking about. But have you ever spoken to a group like this of people that don't agree with you? Yeah, give me... Um, how do you know they don't agree? I just give me the legit, the literal context. Misogynists, or <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just people that don't, aren't on your vibe. Um, to the how question. How do you help them get woke? Yeah, right. <laughs> I always say I'm like women and woke men only. Women and woke people of all genders welcome. Um, <laughs> the first one is to speak from logic. The second one is is empathy. Good, I have, good question. I haven't talked about empathy yet. Empathy is the most powerful thing. Because you see someone who is a man, they can never walk, you know, unless we're on some Kendall Jenner type of shit, but they're not gonna, they can't walk in um, Kylie Jenner, wh whoever, which is the one who's, who is <laughs> male to female. <laughs> I don't even know, you know who I'm talking about. So anyway, the, the someone who is man, someone who is not female, Someone who is white, who is not black. Someone who is straight, who is not gay. Someone who doesn't understand the walk of the life of someone whose voice, just by the daily social cues that we see every single day, uh, has their voice quieted. Someone who doesn't understand that. All we have is empathy. All we have is empathy. It's the most beautiful tool. It's the most beautiful tool. And so what I've tried to do is take stories of times where I felt a certain way and explain it. Not for pity. No. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm playing the drums and speaking about feminism. I'm good. Pity is not what I need. But empathy is what I need. And so thinking about how can I take stories, experiences that I've had that didn't feel so good, that possibly many other people are feeling, 
and explain them and generate empathy. You know, one of the most profound things I learned also from Patrice Cullors, who, whose partner, Future, they were both part of the founding group of Black Lives Matter. She said, or they, pronoun is they, they said, oppressed can easily become the oppressor. Okay, oppressed can easily become the oppressor. And this really was so profound for me because I, I didn't want to make that mistake. You know, and that's part of my own journey and my relationship to my mission about elevating and celebrating the female voice. And so I think for me, empathy is about describing something, not saying that I want to be better than you or assert my power back over you, but explaining how something made me feel with the intention of generating um, a new spark, a new thought. It's about not making anybody feel defensive. The second we put our boxing gloves on, no, nah, that's not the way. It's never going to work, you know. But I think it's, um, I think empathy is the golden ticket when talking about somebody who, who doesn't quite understand. Music? Yeah. Music. Yes. Music. Damn. Francisco, you're gonna make it loud, right? Now, because you see, the worst thing is to perform when it's too quiet. This is the most awkward thing. It's really a, a total nightmare as uh, the performer. So you just make sure it's loud. You make sure my drums hit the stuff. In a world where our president has zero fucks to give. I've been thinking about how I'm supposed to stay woke when the media every day is a damn joke. I'll admit, ma, these are dark times. But the good news is I got trouble on my mind. We got people marching all around the world. Like, if you threaten our rights, we're going to stand up for our girls. Hey, Airbnb and others in the room, clap.
you feel it in the air, then I'll point her. Yes. If you want me to obey, then I'll join her. No. Leaving it to them, that disappoints her. We are living in a world that will spoil her. This is the spotlight one that we talk about in the sound check. You got me. I own my own voice and no I am not afraid I own my own body and no I am not afraid I own my own story and no I am not afraid and I have my own vision so no I am not afraid to do a reading from the Feminist Utopia Project. Make some noise. Before going out into the world, each young woman is fitted with a suit of armor. This shields her from the judgment of those who believe that her intrinsic value is solely in her looks. It renders her immune to those who wish to control her body. She is given a sharp, quick sword to cut through her fears of being made to feel like an outcast for her ambition, to banish the inner demons who only want her to placate, to just be a good sport. 
She is also given a cell phone containing the numbers of marvelous mentors she can call at any time. I want that cell phone, though. Finally, she is crowned with a grand plumed helm, a big feather in her cap to remind her that she will never be made to feel small or unseen. She will always be heard. A reading from this feminist utopia project. See, I own my own voice and no, I am not afraid. I own my own body, Trump. No, I am not afraid. I have my own story. And no, I am not afraid. And I have my own vision. So no, I am not afraid. Thank you. Check, check. I heard Amy Poehler speak at the White House. Her words can be hard like a light bulb. Fictitious stuff pictures of girls must die out. If we want to live in a world that triumphs, I am just talking about loving the femme. I ain't talking about nobody else. Toxic masculinity has to end. I'm just talking about loving ourselves. You can't catch me singing these words in a black other wild future is female t-shirt like a me. I got something to say. Gender construction just get in the way. I've been playing drums since I was like eight. The future is female. The future is great. What you say. Own your voice, don't be afraid. That's the one takeaway from the night. Own your voice. You got it? Where's Steven at? Can you help me pass these out? These are stickers that say own your voice. Just put it somewhere where you need to be reminded daily. ever be an insult. All the women I know are ones moving culture. What would happen if we all would leave with a little less aggression, more femininity? We have to value girls more than our looks. The biggest threat is a girl with a book. The system must make room for all that we do. We've been bleeding each month till we gave birth to you. Where y'all at? Is it because you're sitting down? There's like 45 beers on tap. Let me see y'all standing. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the last song, so give me what you got. There's power in what you say, in what you say. Own your voice, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah, front row, there we go, there we go. That shirt is dope, too. My name is Madam Gandhi. Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you to Shola, Katie, and Reed for hosting me. I'm gonna post up by our merch and hang out with you all. 
and I love you. Thank you for this opportunity.